Hi history lovers and welcome or welcome back to the channel where I bring you new videos every week on all aspects of the past. Today on History Calling we're looking at what happened when Mary I died and most especially at her last will and testament. This document records the dying wishes of a queen and it's a fascinating read. As well as the standard bequest she left to individuals and charitable institutions, I'll unpick her will for you to reveal what it tells us about her delusion that she was pregnant, her complicated feelings towards her immediate family, living and dead, her concern for the succession, and of course, what she wanted done with her body. We'll look at some of her requests, which we know were and weren't followed, and at why she would likely turn in her grave if she knew what that grave was like. Mary was the first Queen of England in her own right to successfully obtain and retain the throne, which Empress Matilda and Lady Jane Grey didn't before anyone brings them up in the comments. But she had a nightmarish journey to the crown and only five years wearing it before her death on the 17th of November 1558 at the age of 42. I already have three videos which cover her life in detail and which I'll leave linked below for you, so I'm not going to rehash everything here, but I do recommend you check those out as viewers who have already watched them usually come back to me in the comments and say that the videos gave them a far better understanding and even sympathy for Mary, despite all the awful things she ultimately did during her reign. Even if you're not familiar with her story though, don't worry, because I'm going to give you a very brief overview of her life here, which will provide the necessary context for the things and people mentioned in her will. Mary was born in 1516, the daughter and only surviving child of King Henry VIII and his first wife, the Spanish princess Catherine of Aragon. Raised an ardent Catholic, her early childhood was happy and secure, but when her father fell in love with Anne Boleyn in the late 1520s and began proceedings to annul his union with Catherine, Mary's whole world fell apart. She took her mother's side in the great matter, as the annulment was referred to at the time, but in 1533 Henry split from the church in Rome, this was the key event in the English Reformation, in order to finally abandon Catherine and marry the pregnant Anne. Catherine was reduced to the Dowager Princess of Wales, because she had previously been married to Henry's brother, Prince Arthur of Wales, and the teenage Mary was declared illegitimate, stripped of her title of princess, forbidden from ever seeing her mother again, though they wrote to each other in secret, and sent to wait on her new half-sister Elizabeth in an attempt to break her spirit and humiliate her into submission. Catherine died in January 1536, and a few months later, Anne, who had also been unable to provide Henry with his longed-for son, fell from grace and was executed. I have a whole playlist just on Anne, which includes videos on her death, and which I'll leave linked on screen and below for you. Wife number three, Jane Seymour, lasted barely 17 months. But she helped to restore Mary to Henry's favour, though Mary had to admit that her parents' marriage had been invalid, and provided a boy, Edward VI born just before she died in 1537. Mary was never re-legitimised, but Henry did place her back in the line of succession in 1543, after Edward and before Elizabeth. The king died in January 1547, and Edward, who was as fervent a Protestant as Mary was a Catholic, reigned for the next six years, during which time he placed increasing pressure on his sister to convert, something she steadfastly resisted. He too died in 1553 at the age of 15, but not before he set in motion an attempt to deny Mary the throne by leaving it to their Protestant cousin Lady Jane Grey. The attempt failed. Mary raised an army of supporters and got her crown. She then set about reversing her father's reformation by re-establishing papal authority in England, had her parents' marriage declared valid again, and in 1554 married King Philip II of Spain, who was her cousin's son. Relations with her half-sister Elizabeth, who had been raised a Protestant, were difficult, and just as Edward had tried and failed to convert Mary to his religion, she tried and failed to convert Elizabeth to hers. There were also plots to oust the Queen and replace her with her sister, some of which Elizabeth may have had knowledge of. See my videos on Elizabeth's early life to learn more. Mary even had her sibling locked up in this very tower at the Tower of London and interrogated at one point. 
She was desperate to have a child to ensure that Elizabeth would not inherit the throne, and was delighted when she found herself apparently pregnant in late 1554, but it turned out to be a pseudo-pregnancy. In early 1558, however, she again believed that she had conceived, and that March she made her will. The first thing any reader of Mary's will will notice is the number of titles she held. This might come as a surprise, because we usually just think of her as Queen of England and Ireland, but through her marriage and her family's ancient, though by this point fictitious, claim on France, her complete list of titles was as follows. Mary, by the grace of God, Queen of England, Spain, France, both Sicilies, Jerusalem and Ireland, Defender of the Faith, Archduchess of Austria, Duchess of Burgundy, Milan and Brabant, Countess of Habsburg, Flanders and Tyrol. The will then goes on to discuss Mary's reasons for making a will at this time, and in hindsight, because we know she wasn't in fact pregnant, it's a tragic read, for she writes that, Thinking myself to be with child, in lawful marriage, between my said dearly beloved husband and lord, although I be at this present, thanks be unto Almighty God, otherwise in good health, yet foreseeing the great danger which by God's ordinance remain to all women in their travel, meaning travail, of children, have thought good, both for discharge of my conscience and continuance of good order within my realms and dominions, to declare my last will and testament. She then adds in a little line which might read as peculiar to modern eyes when we consider that this is a Queen Regnant writing, for she states that the will is being made, quote, with the full consent, agreement, and good contentment of my said most dear lord and husband, end quote. As monarch, Mary didn't need Philip's consent for anything, but as I've mentioned, she was a fervent Catholic and living in the 16th century, and she believed that her husband was the boss, at least as far as was possible given their unusual situation as two monarchs of different countries. After this preamble, one of the first things the will deals with is what should be done with Mary's body. She asked to be buried according to the rites of the Catholic Church, and with all the ceremonies appropriate to her position as Queen, and ordered that during the course of her burial, and certainly within a month of her decease, £1,000 should be given in alms to poor prisoners and other poor men. She then asked that the remains of her mother, Catherine of Aragon, be disinterred from where they had been buried in Peterborough Abbey, placed with Mary's, and a suitable tomb erected over them. This is interesting for a few reasons. First, why hadn't Mary had her mother's body moved somewhere more prominent during her own queenship? She'd had five years, but Catherine still lay where she'd been buried in 1536. See my video on her death and burial for more information. Second, no doubt knowing that Philip would not be buried in England, Mary showed no interest in being interred with any other family member besides her mother, suggesting the difficult relationship she'd had with all of them. Third, she was being rather optimistic that such an interment would take place. She hadn't found the time or money to move her mother, and the next monarch, Elizabeth, didn't either. Catherine remains in Peterborough Cathedral to this day, while Mary lies here in Westminster Abbey, where she was buried on the 14th of December, 1558. In a twist of fate, which would surely have horrified her, it is in fact with Elizabeth that she is buried. We've already heard about their problems with one another, and these are reflected in the will. Elizabeth is not mentioned by name even once in the whole document, and although Mary expected at this point that the crown would go to the child she thought she was carrying, there are no bequests to her sister of personal items to remember her by. Elizabeth was perhaps one of the last people Mary might have chosen to be interred with, and she'd doubtless be even angrier if she knew that her sister's coffin was set on top of hers inside the vault. As for the monument she wanted built for her, the memorial over the top of the two queens was constructed by their cousin, James I, and it is nearly all about Gloriana. You would barely know Mary is here, as she is only mentioned in a Latin inscription on it, which translates to Partners both in throne and grave, here rest we two sisters, Elizabeth and Mary, note that Mary's name doesn't even come first, even though she was older, in the hope of the resurrection. In 1977, a memorial for the martyrs of the Reformation was placed near the sisters' remains. It also mentions Mary's presence, saying, Near the tomb of Mary and Elizabeth, 
Remember before God all those who, divided at the Reformation by different convictions, laid down their lives for Christ and conscience' sake. Given that this memorial commemorates in part Protestants who Mary saw as heretics and many of whom she'd had burnt to death during her reign, I don't imagine for one moment that she'd want them remembered right next to her tomb. However, I think that we could argue that it is fitting that some of those she had killed for their faith are recalled beside her bones. After all, they couldn't be given a Christian burial because of the way in which Mary had had them executed. I hope you're enjoying this video so far. If so, please remember to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel with the notification switched on so that YouTube lets you know each time I upload. You can also find links to my Instagram and to various books, movies and TV shows about Mary's life and times in the description box below. Many parts of the will are pretty standard for a document of this kind. Mary asked for her debts to be paid and those of her father and brother too, from which we can infer that she hadn't paid off all their debts herself. She also left legacies to religious institutions. Indeed, her will was her last chance to try to undo the damage done to the Catholic Church in England by the Reformation. There was £500 each to the religious houses of Sheen and Sion, for instance, both of which had been founded by Henry V but were then, quote, clearly dissolved and defaced during the time of the late schism within this realm. Mary and Philip had re-established them, however, and she didn't want them to fall now. There were numerous other bequests to friaries and convents too, and Mary asked that the nuns and monks at Sion and Sheen pray for my soul and the soul of my said most dear and well-beloved husband, the King's Majesty, when God shall call him to his mercy out of this transitory life and for the soul of the said good and virtuous queen, my mother, and for the souls of all other our progenitors, and namely the said King Henry V. Asking for prayers to be said for her, her husband and her mother is not unusual for a Catholic woman, but what is striking is who is not prayed for here, or at least not mentioned by name. Henry V is there, yet there is no specific request for prayers for Mary's father, brother, or, when the time came, her sister. At best, we could say that Henry and Edward were lumped in under the term progenitors, though that word doesn't really suit Edward, who wasn't her ancestor. But I have to wonder whether Mary cared one way or the other, or if she thought they were beyond helping. In fact, the whole will shows Mary's lingering negative attitude towards these two. While Philip and Catherine are never mentioned, unless their names are preceded by flowery epithets describing how much Mary adored her most dear and well-beloved husband, and the virtuous lady and my most dear and well-beloved mother of happy memory, Queen Catherine, when Henry and Edward are referred to, it is fleeting and completely clinical. They are just called Mary's father or brother, and that's it. Even her paternal grandfather, who she had never known, is shown more courtesy being referred to as my grandfather of most worthy memory, King Henry VII. The same can be said for her most noble progenitor, King Henry V. Mary was past pretending that she liked or even particularly respected the parent and sibling who had made her life so miserable for so many years, and who were either Protestant, as in the case of Edward, or had allowed Protestantism into England, as Henry VIII had done. The will even provided one last opportunity for her to confirm again that despite all her father's protestations, her parents really were married and Mary was legitimate. This was achieved by referring to her mother as a queen. Other institutions given money included £500 for the relief of the poor scholars in either of the universities of Oxford and Cambridge, especially if those scholars were training for the priesthood. There was also £200 for the master and brethren, meaning brethren, I think, of the Hospital of Savoy, which had been founded by Henry VII, and money left to found and pay the staff of another hospital for poor soldiers, which she wanted created within London. Plenty of individuals who the Queen knew personally were left bequests too. We've already seen that Elizabeth didn't make the cut, but King Philip certainly did. Mary left her husband two table diamonds, one of which had been given to her by his father Charles, to whom Mary had been engaged as a child, and the other which he had sent to her himself. There was also a collar of gold set with nine diamonds, which Philip had given her at the epiphany after their marriage, 
and a gold ring set with a ruby which she had gifted her via the Count of Feria. If you're wondering how Philip reacted to her death, by the way, he said that he, quote, felt a reasonable regret for it. Hardly the overflowing show of emotion Mary might have hoped for, but probably as much as could be expected from her much younger husband, who had married her out of familial and dynastic duty rather than love. For her ordinary servants, she left £2,000 to be distributed amongst them by her executors within three months of her death, with preference to be given to those who had served her longest and had the least hope of getting another job after her demise. There was also £3,400 set aside for bequests to specific people, including £200 for her almoner and confessor, Dr Mallet, to pray for her soul. Aside from her body and personal and charitable bequests, another major theme of the will is what would happen to England once the Queen was gone. Mary, as we've seen, was operating under the assumption that she was pregnant, and she anticipated a long minority for her son or daughter, in which her husband Philip would have a leading role. She expected all her subjects to be loyal to her widower, who she praised for his desire to return England to the Catholic Church, and wrote that she did not doubt but that he would continue to act in a way which would be for the good of her realm and its people. This is the same Philip who launched the Spanish Armada against England 30 years later, by the way. That was in March 1558. By the end of October, the situation had changed. On the 28th of that month, with barely three weeks to live, Mary signed a codicil to her will, which must have cost her dear in terms of its emotional toll. She had had no child, she said, and only God knew if she ever would. Furthermore, she now felt herself, quote, presently sick and weak in body, and yet of whole and perfect remembrance, our Lord be thanked, and so her conscience dictated that she make some new provision for her kingdom. She now acknowledged that with no offspring, her kingdom would go to, quote, my next heir and successor, according to the laws and statutes of this realm, and ask that that heir allow her executors to carry out the instructions she had left in her will, obviously excluding anything relating to a minority. She was speaking, of course, about her sister Elizabeth, but as I've already said, the future queen's name is never mentioned once in the will, nor did Mary use the word sister to describe her. She could only just bring herself to admit that by the laws of the land, meaning the act of succession passed in their father's time, Elizabeth was next in line. As for her husband, Mary had to admit in the codicil that he would, quote, for default of heir of my body, have no further government, order, and rule within this realm and the dominions thereunto belonging. Still, she begged Philip, in light of her love for him, their marriage, and the affection she felt he had previously shown England and its people, that he would, quote, show himself as a father in his care, as a brother or member of this realm in his love and favour, and as a most assured and undoubted friend in his power and strength to my said heir and successor, and to this my country and the subjects of the same. She added that she had no doubt that Elizabeth and the English people will answer it unto his majesty with the like benevolence and good will, the which I most heartily require them to do, both for my sake and for the honour and surety of this realm. I have no idea if she really believed all of this, but let's just say that it didn't work out that way. Again, see my videos on Elizabeth's life to find out how the Tudor era progressed once Mary was gone. At the end of the original will, Mary named her executors. These were her cousin, Cardinal Pole, a man who had encouraged her in the mass burning of Protestants, Nicholas Heath, Archbishop of York and Chancellor of England, William, Marquess of Winchester, who was the Lord Treasurer, the Earls of Arundel, Westmoreland, Shrewsbury, Derby, Sussex and Pembroke, Viscount Montague, Lord Clinton, who was the High Admiral of England, the Bishop of Ely, Lord Hastings, who was Mary's Lord Chamberlain of the Household, and Sir William Cordell, who was her Master of the Rules of the Court of Chancery. Cardinal Pole was to get £1,000 for his troubles. The others variously got £500 or 500 marks. These executors were to be assisted in their work by Sir Thomas Cornwallis, Comptroller of the Queen's Household, Sir Henry Jernigan, Master of Her Horses, John Boxall, her Chief Secretary, Sir Edward Waldegrave, Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, 
Sir Francis Englefield, Master of the Court of Wards and Liveries, and Sir John Baker, Chancellor of the Exchequer. They were each to receive £200 for this assistance. It's difficult to know if all Mary's bequests were enacted. As we've seen, Elizabeth opted to ignore her burial demands, and Philip certainly didn't continue to show great love towards England. The religious communities Mary had hoped would flourish and pray for her soul and the souls of her family ultimately went extinct, and I can tell you too that Cardinal Pole wasn't one of her executors for the simple reason that he died 12 hours after her. Still, there is no reason to doubt that personal gifts to servants were paid, and we know that the funeral was conducted using her father's funeral book, which meant in effect that it was done according to Catholic rites. Elizabeth put one of Mary's executors, the Marquis of Winchester, in charge of proceedings too, which her sister would surely have had no objection to. The two great goals of Mary's will, and I think her life, failed though. She had no child to pass her throne to, and her country did not stay under papal authority. She may have been England's first successful Queen Regnant, but she has been eclipsed by her younger sister in the historical record and even in her grave and rather than being remembered by the flattering epithet of Gloriana, she is recalled as Bloody Mary, because of how many people she had burned. It was a sad end to a life which had held so much promise in its first years. Before I go, a big thank you to my patrons for their support of this channel, which helps me to keep creating videos for you. If you'd like to become a patron and get some history calling perks, see the Patreon link in the description box below. For more on the Tudors, try one of these videos next, and let me know in the comments if you think Elizabeth ought to have moved Catherine of Aragon's bones so that they are buried with Mary's. I'll be back next week with a new video, and until then, keep learning.